Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is John Roth. John has a BFA in design from the Kansas City Art Institute. Um, he currently is the creative director at Nebraska Printing Center in Lincoln. He's worked for numerous advertising agencies throughout the Midwest and he also was an instructor at Nebraska Wesleyan University. John has written two books with Mary Jane Nielsen. The first one was called Lincoln Looks Back, and this one is called When I Was a Kid. Um, his talk today is titled At Home and Bloggren, Something New. Please join me in welcoming John Roth. Well, I'm glad to be back, but I wish it was as warm as it was the last time I was here. Um, what I'm going to do today, a few of the photos that I'm going to start with, and when I say a few, I mean quite a few, uh, came from Jim and Myrna Heldenbrand in Frederick, Maryland. And they are of all of the original Lincoln Public Schools circa 1920 and before. So these are kind of fun images I thought would be fun to show. And Mary Jane, or uh, Eileen's ab absolutely right. Mary Jane and I just completed another book when I was a kid. Got lots of fabulous stories from Lincolnites for that. And so one of the things that was a recurring theme, of course, was Lincoln Public Schools. A lot of uh, the stories about are about kids that went to school at one of the elementary schools here in Lincoln. So we're glad to be able to share those photos with you. So I'm just going to go ahead and start here. Uh, this first one, of course, is Prescott School. You recognize that one easy enough. And what I find about most of these is the time period's really easy to detect because the trees are so young in all the photos. Whittier. Photo I've never seen of Whittier when it was either an elementary school or a junior high. I know it wound up being a junior high. I think Ed Zimmer would be the expert on these. Saratoga, which is my alma mater, and uh, actually led me to find Don Hobbs, my principal at Saratoga, to write the foreword for the book. So, and that building still stands a bit, but it's certainly been modified quite a bit from its original standards there. Park, which is now a junior high and of course at that time was an elementary school. Longfellow, this is a school I'm not familiar with. Roxanne? I'm sorry, I'm curious. Do you know which way these are facing? Which street we're looking at as we're looking at them? Because I can't recognize any of them. Uh, I don't recognize this one for sure. Now Park, I can tell you, uh, is down on, um, what, F Street, uh, near 6th, 7th Street, somewhere in there. And it should be facing, it would be facing uh, south, I believe. So that was looking from the park. Yeah, from Cooper Park back, you'd be looking north. But the school's facing south, I think, yeah. Now Longfellow, I don't have a clue. Again, I think Zimmer's the guy we have to consult on these. And this is the first time I've shown them. We haven't had them that long, so... We have to do our homework on these and find out where everything is. Hartley, of course. Like I say, look at how young those trees are. Cherry Street. Didn't even know there was a Cherry Street in Lincoln, Nebraska. Clinton. And so far we haven't seen one that really tells us, doesn't give us any historical artifacts parked out in front to kind of give us a time frame. Of course, Capital School was not raised that long ago, the original, and then of course the new school was built around the old school. Oh, we went. Bancroft, looks a little like Lincoln High. There's the original Everett. Hayward, of course. Love the streets. 
Elliot. Belmont. And you wondered why the Belmont boys were so tough. <laughs> Look at this place. <laughs> McKinley, again, I wish I could tell you, we have to get together with Ed Zimmer for sure. Look at this, I love this, it's not even listed as Lincoln High, it's simply listed as High. Randolph, check out this car. <laughs> what kind of car is that? I have no idea. Probably an Essex or something like that. It's certainly, certainly an old vintage automobile. Now this one I love and I had to go and do a detail for you to show you just how old these photographs are. You see the kids playing up around the wrought iron railing? Check out this detail. Look at what they're playing with. Hoops, Hoops and sticks. Isn't that amazing? So we thank Jim and Myrna Heldenbrand for those photos. What a wonderful treasure and thanks for finding us with those. Well, one of the stories in the book is written by me and covers a couple of buddies of mine that I had a fabulous story that occurred at this car hop area at 19th and O Street of the original Kings. And this was a notorious place on a Saturday night where they had so much in the way of traffic jams that they literally started to charge for carloads of kids to drive through the place. It was that popular. But in the 70s, in my era, the car hops came out, took your order, hung the tray of food on the car window and went back inside and one day a couple of my buddies were there and ordered some food and of course I had this buddy that liked to write checks that his mouth couldn't cash and he got a little smart with one of the car hops. <laughs> she proceeded to go down and find a four-door sedan full of collegians that were about twice the size of my buddies and they came over and put the crush on my friend's malt and shook it all over the headliner of his car. <laughs> Well, the only thing that the friend that had made the original mark could say to the friend that shook the, head, the, the malt all over his mom's headliner was, look what you did to my mom's car. So that's, that's the way that usually goes. Vic Wright had some interesting stories about Pete the cop coming in here and, and keeping an eye on the place and, and uh, running you out if your muffler, muffler was too loud or if you were causing trouble or making a nuisance of yourself. But again, today this is a parking lot for physicians. Uh, collaborative there at uh, what was Duto Chevrolet, it's simply a parking lot now. We've got a nice exterior shot of it here. So the carport would be around and to the left of where you're looking in this photograph. That's 19th and O where you see the King sign. Well, we uh, received a wonderful story from uh, a William Hemke, who just happens to be Sheriff Bill of Sheriff Bill and Silent Orv. Now, those of you that are my age or older will remember Sheriff Bill and Silent Orv. We lost Orv a couple of years ago, but uh, it's wonderful that uh, Bill is still around. And he writes, uh, no bells or whistles, just two lawmen on the set of East Cupcake County Jail, which I thought was a great name for a, for a jail. That was Cartoon Corral on KOLN KGIM TV from 56 till 69. Wow. The program aired daily from 3.30 to 4.30 with an audience of children on the set, most celebrating birthdays. The program became so popular that reservations had to be made by parents six months in advance of the show. Orv passed away in January 2008, but the sheriff is still plodding along and he's still surrounded by kids, 14 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren to be exact. Wonderful story. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, Silent Orv is, uh, is on the right there. And notice the S. I love the wonderful dyslexic sheriff sign up, up behind his head. That was always a keeper. And 
that stayed on during the Calamity Kate era. They, they never got rid of that set. Well, I found, and I think you've seen this photo before. This is uh, 1940s. We had a gentleman here in town. His mother worked at Western Electric, and he made it to the finals in Ohio for the International Soapbox Derby. And uh, this, this show was in amongst uh, early 1940s, around 1941 shots. I found great big 8x10 negatives and envelopes that were probably McDonald era, fo era photos. This is probably not an Ed Holman Blomgren photograph. But going through some two and a quarter film one day, fast forward to 1967, and here's a young man named Kenny Klein who won the Soapbox Derby Nationals in 1967 with his experimental car. I think it was called the Alligator. And notice how far back he's got a headrest on it, how far back you lean in the car to drive the car. Quite a difference from that, from that 1941 variety. Um, we got a lot of stories about the things that kids didn't like. One of the things that, that kids didn't like was the after-school appointment, whether it involved a dentist or a barber or what have you. I suppose the trip was rather frightening in and of itself, going up into the Sharp or the Stewart building to see your dentist. This is uh, Dr. Kenneth Holland in the Sharp building. And uh, we put this in the book and we could not identify him. And about a week later, Lita Powell Drake called me and said, we were just having a discussion last night and we're all certain that that's Dr. Kenneth Holland up in the Sharp building. So many, many years. My dentist, to tell you how frightening mine was, he was up on the 10th floor of the Stewart building, and he was Irwin R. Payne. So his <laughs> initials formed I.R. Payne. How would you like to go to a dentist with that name? No, he's a really gentle man. He was very nice. Well, the consummate put the board across the arms of the barbershop chair and put Junior up and give him a haircut. This kid's just enjoying it way too much. <laughs> I never liked haircuts like that. Look at the, uh, which, which by the way is an Ed Holman Blomgren product, is the horizontal photograph of the entire Nebraska football team of the era. Those were always in barber shops. Just uncovered a beautiful shot of goals. We had had pictures of the awning on the N Street side with the Christmas trees, but I remember they completely surrounded the building with these little fir trees that they put up on the awning and actually decorated them with lights. And you can see here that they're spaced evenly and all the way around on the awning and a beautiful wet winter night. Things are melting a bit, beautiful reflections in the street. I think these are my favorite kinds of Ed Holman Blomgren photographs, those taken at night. Well, I love this because uh, um, a lady sent in a wonderful story about holiday memories, and then we just happened to get in the mail this, this photograph from Mally Keelan. And that's Mally, closest to Santa Claus, looking up at him, and his cousins Sid and Billy. This is 1951 at Gold's department store. Pretty magical stuff. We had great stories about this little grocery store. This is my photo. I just took this. As a matter of fact, I strolled over on a fall day to 31st and T and took this photograph. I believe this may be an architectural firm now. Some some professional might might have this. I don't know whether it's a it's a. Melinda Pearson owned it for a while and ran her architectural firm out of there, and then she sold it two years ago. Okay, very good. Well, this gentleman sent in a. Uh, story about the chest freezer Pepsi pop machine that used to sit right outside the store. And um, some vandals came along one night, and popped the top of the thing open, and took a very long straw and popped all the caps off the bottles, which you could not pull out of the machine, by the way. You had to slide them down the track to get them out. But these Weisenheimers figured out that they could get a <laughs> bottle opener in there. And they found all empty bottles Monday morning after the vandals had, and somebody had a tummy ache after that, I'm sure. But this is great because he, he wrote that at the time, and this is just sort of an ironic thing that this crime occurred at this location. 
this was our Lincoln police, one of our Lincoln police chiefs, Tom Casty's first jobs was hauling groceries at this grocery store. And that's in the story in the book. Well, we're going to lose the why here. Um, and I remember this, this is fond memories for me because as recently as eight, ten years ago, I took my daughter to swimming lessons at the Y. This pool was still intact. Did you ever get to see this? This was a wonderful pool. It had ceramic tile in it, beautifully colored ceramic tile. Yeah, you just don't see things like that anymore. Wonderful, wonderful venue. <laughs> Those pesky little brothers. You couldn't take them anywhere. I love the outfit. Is this not creative? Kings was hosting some kind of a costume party in a neighborhood. They had a neighborhood party where they were handing out Pepsis and hamburgers, and everybody's wearing a number to go and have their costume judged. But uh, I thought this was rather a creative use of corrugated cardboard myself. <laughs> We had a story from a lady that had grown up southeast of town, just outside the city limits. Her name was Elaine Whipperman Hall. She grew up on a poultry farm. And the wonderful story that she had, of course, this photo has nothing to do with her particular poultry farm, but I enjoy it. It's, it's a wonderful photo. And these series of Quonset huts would have to be cleaned occasionally in the spring. And her pastime would be when her dad was hosing the concrete down inside the Quonset huts, that was her skating rink. So she got to go in and skate in all the Quonset huts. And I thought that was a wonderful memory. But yeah, this couple seems to be pretty happy with their production. Um, Williams Cleaners had a great idea back in the 50s when Bambi came to town, they made dry cleaner bags that you would wear as an outfit to see Bambi. It had a likeness of Bambi on the front of it. Now we all know that nobody puts dry cleaner bags on their heads these days, <laughs> but in the 50s it was a good idea. You can see the, the little one walking down the sidewalk, how she's got the full-size image of Bambi on the front of her. And this is probably a guy keeping everybody in line this changed at some point because when I went to all my Kurt Russell movies and my Disney movies, the line went past Nebraska Central and around the other way back to the alley. And you always knew if you were standing on the cobblestone of the alley by the library, you probably weren't going to make it to the window to get into the movie. <laughs> Here's a little one at the food basket, another great gold shot. This is a metal gold promotion photograph. And look at the size of the ice cream cone this guy is holding. <laughs> now that's a tiny ice cream cone. Just right for that little one. We had a uh, story written in by Charlene Neely called The Bus Driver That Saved Christmas about a bus driver who during a blizzard one Christmas, gee, I can't relate to that, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> saved Christmas by going and getting his four-wheel drive Jeep and rescuing all the presents that the patrons that were riding the bus had to get off of because it broke down. And this guy went and got his Jeep and delivered everybody's presents to him. And he didn't get there until morning in some cases, but he did, in fact, get everyone's presents to him. And I thought that was a very valiant story. He certainly was at that time, wasn't he? Notice White Christmas is showing at the Lincoln Theater. This is, uh, this is M Street, by the way. We're between 12th and 13th. This is the south side of the street. And of course, none of those buildings behind the bus stand anymore. That's what became the first National Bank building of Lincoln. It was the Sen Gas building for a long time. First Continental National Bank originally. That's right, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Rupert's, of course, on the corner at 13th. Okay, I'm going to have to admit right away that I doctored this photograph. But I've, and you've seen, probably seen this photograph before, too. But, you know, I couldn't for the life of me understand. I worked at an advertising agency, and I'm trying to think of what possible reason this photograph could have been taken. 
with seven people in the interior of a V-dub with everything piled up on top of it. I added the Sylvester cat because a lady named uh, Karis Thomas had written in a story about how they had gone to the Southwest on vacation. And they stopped at a place where she could win a five-foot-tall stuffed Sylvester <laughs> cat. Now, it's a great thing if your kid wins a Sylvester cat, right? But what are you going to do with it? You're on vacation. you got to put it up on top of the car, right? So this story, I asked her if I could use this title. I called this, If at First You Don't Succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've shown outtakes of this photo before, but I found this one that had a couple of Lincoln's finest parked in the photograph. Look at the bullhorn up on top of the uh, Ford. Wonderful shot. And I love all the effort that went into the making of this outfit. But this was a serious deal. This was Isaac Asimov. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking it was Destination Moon. I think this movie took three years to make, and it, it came in at the Varsity Theater. And at that time, you know, science fiction, this was pretty serious stuff. Of course, this was not an astronaut at that time. He was a spaceman. And I like everything about his outfit right down to those floor shine shoes. <laughs> those are beautiful, aren't they? Of course, this is, at, uh, this is right out in front of Miller and Payne. Uh, Harvey Brothers would be right next to what became Hovel and Swanson's. Of course, the famous. You ladies love to get your dresses at the famous. I know my mom did. And, of course, right along in that vein, you know, what, what better thing to do when Junior comes home from his duck and cover drill but give him his very own ballistic missile. <laughs> <laughs> Later, I remember, we, we put together Estes rockets and that you had these little rocket fuel cylinders that would go up inside the tube, just no, nothing more than a toilet paper tube, and uh, would launch itself. Well, this must have been the variety that uh, Van Morrison sings about in Brown Eyed Girl, a transistor radio. Of course, we have literally hundreds of photos that were taken as detail photos for goals for newspaper ads. And I think everybody had one of these with the little earphone that you put in one ear and you listen to your transistor radio. Dennis Buckley wrote in a baseball memory story from, uh, from his childhood that was very good that involved this photo. Well, who remembers those school lunches? And, you know, no matter what they say, they were nutritious. Weren't school lunches nutritious back when we were kids? Look at this menu. Hamburger with bun, buttered green beans, tossed salad, canned fruit, and milk. Vegetable soup, ham or egg salad sandwich, fresh fruit salad, fruit cobbler, and milk. I'd have brought cold lunch that day. Wednesday, beef noodles, ooh, beef and noodles. Now there was a great smell in an elementary school, right? Nothing smelled better than that except maybe chili. Chili was great. Notice that I wanted to point out Thursday, and you, you'd right away you'd look at that and you'd say, well, that's a typo. They've got runs as spelled with an S. No, Don Everett has that copyrighted, so the schools could not use the spelling R-U-N-Z-A. It is indeed R-U-N-S-A. And I even have a German from Russia grandmother that used to insist that's the original spelling of Runza, with an S. She seems to think that's the way it might have originally been spelled. Well, this is a little toy store over in Rathbone Village that was simply called the Toy Man. And notice the little girl making her selection of a dolly with the guy. And I love the cash register. The old punch it in, it's got the, got the tape coming out the back side of it. Huge drawer to put the money in. But look at all these toys. I just like to peruse the shelves for a while and look at everything that every little kid was playing with. I would imagine that Structo freight truck up there would bring about five, six hundred dollars now. It was probably a five dollar item back then. I had to put this in. This came from Montgomery Ward. It was $4.95, and I took this shot at Christmas time because I found this up in the rafters of my garage. And I bought this house for my sister. 
So I had an idea that it was probably hers. And I took it and gave it to my dad, and he sanded it down and restored it the best he could. But the wonderful thing about this little chair is it's got a little music box attached to the rung underneath. And as you rock, the button pushes in and out and plays Rockabye Baby. And the thing still works. It was $4.95 in the 1950s. Go figure. A howdy doody? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And it's a chair like that, and it's a musical chair? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, this was, this was the best Montgomery Ward had to offer in the 1950s. Wonderful little chair. Goals also had, they sponsored events like this was a sock hop that they sponsored. They had, uh, remember they had, they had shopping bag Saturdays. They had birthdays where you, where you got birthday cake. They had pajama parties. The list went on and on. If there was a way to promote something, Nathan Gold found a way to promote it. And this was a 1950s sock hop. Okay, over at uh, 33rd Street, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is there still a national pharmacy at that corner? Yes. 33rd and yes. A Street? Yes. This was Gehring Drugstore. This is probably typical of a lot of drugstores that uh, we used to go to back in the 50s and 60s that had their own soda fountains within. This is Gehring Drug at 33rd. Notice the uh, Johnson nut counter that has the rotating tray of pecans and cashews and they kept them warm all the time for you and you took your little wax bag and filled it up with your own variety of nuts. They couldn't have crammed more stuff into a drugstore back then. Look at all that stuff. Well, I have a friend, uh, uh, Jack Davis, who uh, worked with me at uh, Ayers & Associates, who was an, he, today he's a children's book illustrator. He lives in Port Towns in Washington. But I laughed when I came across this negative <laughs> because Jack doesn't look anything like this anymore. <laughs> But he, uh, he's an accomplished musician. He, was a, he was a, uh, acoustic, played the acoustic guitar and uh, lead guitar very well. But uh, uh, I think this was probably taken for Dietz Music House, if I'm not mistaken, when I looked at the negative, and I seem to recall him saying that he was indeed a salesman there at one time. And uh, just, uh, you, you've, you've got to see Jack today, today to believe how much different this man is than, than this photograph would seem to suggest. <laughs> Uh, I had to put this in down at about uh, oh, 17th on O Street. I think there's a carpet seller there now. And at the time, this Studebaker dealership became Jim Dyer Sportswear. And we had a couple of Texair dryers going around the clock up on the second floor. And look at these great big windows in the place. I think it must have gotten up around 140 degrees in this place in the summertime. And we were up there in our tank top silk screening these t-shirts. Next door, I, I was looking at this building. This is the Nevcor. This was a linoleum covering place back, way back when. Now it's a carpet place, so it's kind of ironic that it sort of stayed the way it was. Novo Leasing obviously has become the other half of the carpet store that's here, but does anybody remember what this was, what this Novo Leasing became, or this building next to this Novo Leasing became in the 70s? Because that's what's great about archi archival photography, that makes you remember stuff. You look at it and you say, oh my gosh, that was so short-lived, I forgot that was even there. Well, look over here toward the center of the photograph, next to Nova Leasing. Do you see the word embassy on the front of the building? It became an X-rated theater, which is no longer there, thankfully, but uh, how times change. And I'd completely forgotten about this place. It, didn't, it wasn't around that long. Okay, I'm gonna cycle in here. Bear with me for a minute. And we're gonna go back. Now, some of these you may have already seen, but we're going to want to keep rolling here.
Okay, some memories here that I go back. I, I, I remember uh, Clark mentioning this photograph. I wanted to bring this one back. Sherry Irway at the Hillcrest Country Club in that new Nash, this Nash Air Flight with the top that was prone to blow up and out of the railings. <laughs> that was the best you could have for a convertible back then, apparently. There's the Kings at 40th and South, what everybody called the Southeast Kings. A 1959 parade on 11th Street. Centennial, probably. Yeah, it is the centennial. And that notice that last year was supposed to be our sesquicentennial, right? But we've moved that to 2017 because Lincoln wasn't Lincoln in 1859. It was Lancaster, so we're going to... I uh, had to get a shot over the top of this falcon to show the original corn popper. And then you can see that the YWCA at one time had a cafeteria in it down at 15th Street. You can see the sign up above. I worked in that cafeteria. Did you? And was the food good? Very good. That's what I understand. There was a women's housing facility to the right of the corn popper. You walk between the corn popper and the little cafe next door, and there was an alley between With the tar paper on it or the next building over? Wow, that's interesting, Bob. If you didn't hear that, uh, Bob Ripley is telling us about a woman's housing unit that's directly behind the Falcon here that existed where a woman could rent her own apartment. This is, in, in all likelihood, the early 60s, I would bet, right? 61, 62? Nice, nice to know. Tony's just a nice little bit of architecture here. Of course, there's that 1959 Centennial Mall we've talked about in the past. Ken Eddy's. I wrote in the book that I can hear 16 candles by the crest playing when I look at this photo. It really is the consummate 1950s drive-in shot. Well, you sort of get an idea where Larry Price got the idea for the diamond treatment that he used for Kings for so many years. But this is not Kings, this is the Copper Kettle. And the Copper Kettle was housed in the Lindell Hotel. Mm -hmm. Tilden's Copper Kettle. What's that? Tilden's. Tilden. Yeah, and that was a little bit, I, there's, there's some, some gray area there that, that they might have partnered up on that somehow or that he had some kind of an interest in it, but I haven't been able to to track that down, but I'm looking at that diamond pattern on those. And of course, Tillman's had a number of cafeterias, one in the Stewart building. They had the coffee shop and the bus station across the street from the Cornhusker. Uh, they had Tillman's Plaza, which was in Rathbone Village, which became the Red Rooster eventually. So Mr. Tillman, oh, he had the cave. Nobody, nobody knows about the cave, but that was quite a venue at one time. It was the Metazoic Age or the Preozoic, pre, Prehistoric Age and it had stalactites and it had, it was quite a, quite a place from what I understand. Again, I think this is the Copper Kettle. And I just, ma'am, what was your name again? They gave me the postcard. Nelson. Well, Ms. Nelson brought me this wonderful shot of dominoes, and of course that's what you're looking at here. The giveaway is the fountain outside, the window, the trapezoid window, that, that tacky 1950s architecture that we used to see. By the way, uh, they just closed the Diamond Vogel paint store at uh, Cotner and, and uh, Holdridge Street. Have you ever noticed that those, those windows are, in, are of an inverted trapezoid? Is, do they call that a trapezoid variety or a just kind of canted, it was canted a, windows? It was as much to divert a traffic noise, noise because windows are perfectly horizontal or vertical. Really? They could rattle with trucks and stuff. Like Had that. no idea. That's a great. That's a great thing to know. Bob saying that the reason that they inverted the windows like that was because it was to deaden the sound, so that it would be trapped by the window and go downward. Nice to know. Another Kennedy shot. 
This is the powwow room at the Cornhusker, one of many. You had the Landmark, you had the Wigwam. No, you didn't have the Wigwam. What did you have? What was the other one? The TP room, that's right. Well, we've seen this a number of times. Robert Culp with his 59 Buick LeSabre. Uh, this is Carl, I'm trying to think of his last name. He was married to Johnny Cash's wife originally, who would, the lady that would become Johnny Cash's wife. Carl Smith, I think, at goals at the record department. Sort of the segue from Rocky, Rockabilly into Elvis, very popular at the time, as the hairdo would suggest. This is a view, this is kind of interesting because it's a view uh, looking back across 48th Street towards uh, Ken Eddy's, which of course was positioned at an angle at the, at the corner of 48th and, uh, and O Street there. This was uh, Rohrbaugh's IGA, Park and Shop. They had a place called Park and Shop that was over, oh, probably about where uh, the auto store is today. I think there's an auto parts store there now. Rohrbaugh's so, building's still there. Is it still there? They just kind of covered it over. The first building north of O Street on 48th on the east side. So that's the one that was Blockbuster and it's been abandoned? Correct. Uh-huh. Well, Very good. Yeah. It's, but this is right on, it's right on 48th. Yeah, well, there's nothing else there now that they tore that gas station out, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I, you know, you, the, the tasty end that you know of that's still here, of course, is at, uh, for, just off 48th and Holdridge to the north there. But we did have one down at 13th and Q at one time. And, uh, you know, same, same product. Uh, this place closed and became the Hong Kong Pizza King. Now, <laughs> let me tell you, these guys had a mean meatball sandwich. Now, why you got a meatball sandwich at a place called the Hong Kong Pizza King is beyond me, but that's what it was called, and it later became Pontillo's, which then, of course, transitioned into Da Vinci's with me. There's the original. I always love to show this photo because I like to point out the little articulating mobile that they had that blew in the wind out on 48th Street, the red disc that would catch the wind. And this thing would swing in and out as the wind would blow to the north or south, and it would sort of like, and I don't imagine anybody in the city, city's offices would let you get away with putting something so close to the right of way like that now, but old Jug Jorgensen knew how to get his customers in. Look in the opposite direction. Of course, this drive up became a convenient place to house Christmas trees in the wintertime so he could sell his share of Christmas trees the same way that Gene would at Zesto's at 11th and, 11th and South. And I think probably at one time those are about the only two places in Lincoln you could buy a Christmas tree without going outside the city limits. There's Tillman's Coffee Shop. Of course, we still have this lovely bus station. Um, gosh, this has housed a lot of stuff. This entire complex, I, I have a picture of Richard Nixon going into the Cornhusker back in the 50s, and there's an Edsel dealership in this building. <laughs> it's unbelievable how many things have, have changed. It's been Tillman's, it's been this, it's been that. A few years earlier, it becomes the Corn Cob, which, of course, everybody t touts as a favorite haunt of Marie Sandoz to go and do some thinking and writing in. So, same location. There's the cave. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? This is a Tillman operation. Wasn't this guy creative? He had an idea for everything. This was in Rathbone Village, down in the lower level. You know, it had to be in a basement. It couldn't be up above if it was. And you know that building's still there? And, you know, it's been so many bars, four friends and uh, Ebenezer's, and now it's a coffee shop called Italia, I think, and... It was the Red Rooster for many, many years, that's right. Before that, of course, Tillman's Plaza was up above, so. Good steaks down there. I've eaten in that cave. Did you? Was it good? <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody yeah. said they had their wedding reception there, and I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was. But, uh, oh, 
Well, this speaks for itself. I mean, you just, you just can't believe what this place looked like in 1955. This was a desolate place. This was the north end of the Miracle Mile. And of course, the Starview Theater went in and uh, a few gas stations popped up here and there. Notice the United Rentals over. It's still there. It's still there. It's a, it's a U-Haul dealer today. It's just absolutely amazing. You know, I'm just wondering, is that possibly, I'm trying to think, because I know this has got to be Vine Street going here. Could that be the famous docks, whatever it is now? Dr. John's. Dr. John's. Is that Dr. John's now? Because <laughs> it, it's way down across, and I know U-Haul came this way, so. Funny. That's a chuckler. There's Mr. Tillman and the colonel himself touting a bucket of fried chicken. How are we doing on time? Got about 17 minutes. Very good. Well, it's still standing. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> of course, you've seen the McDonald photo that shows around the corner of the 1928 American LaFrance fire truck with all the guys on it. And believe it or not, there's a few remnants of that old fire station left in this building. Again, Schaefer's um, appliances, popcorn, and soda fountains. Just you make it however you make it as a businessman in the 60s, and that's that was their combination. You could get sandwiches, you could get candy. You could get everything here. Not too many places you can go today and get a refrigerator, a cigar, and a sandwich, right? <laughs> of course, Odell's cut my hair many times. Odell's Barbershop. It was so close to Everett, that's where I had to walk to get my hair cut after school. I like to throw this old color shot of uh, Don Mar in from time to time. I love the old post-mounted mailbox there, the red and blue post-mounted mailbox. Of course, they've got the penny scale outside, no, no vandals to worry about. It sits outside all night long and nobody messes with it. This is actually 14th and South. 14th and South. And, and the thing that's just recently happened in the, in the last couple of years is they've sort of straightened this out a little bit. They made the jog that goes south not quite as severe. It's a tanning place now. It is a tanning place. It was Jim's Drug for many years, then Jim's Home Health Supplies. and Oh, they had everything. Around the corner, you're absolutely right, they had Allen's Alley, which was the best hardware store in the world. Later becomes Handyman Hardware, about a block down. You've got Knight's Family Store, you've got French's Cleaners, you've got Wendell and Baking Company, which is the famous baking company, famous for Aunt Betty Bread. <laughs> but that's, I, I'll tell you, that's but a small degree of what they did. You couldn't walk by this place without going in and getting a Bismarck. They just smelled wonderful. They were the best. Across the street, you've got Lincoln Lock and Cycle, which was a great little bike shop. Bill Shoe Hospital. Hasco was an appliance place. Oh, Spencer Steakhouse. That's right. Where the the only remnants left of Spencer Steakhouse is a badly drawn graffiti sign that says Lincoln Boxing Club, and there's a few trophies, sparse trophies in the window, and but the black glass tile is still there, and the windows are still there. Uh, it, it largely still stands. Yeah, it was. It was either a Goodwill or a Salvation Army. Um, Don Marr was a great place, too. Top 50 records, you could buy any 45 record. The top 50 on KLMS was on pegboard inside this place, and you'd go inside and listen to it before you bought it. They had a soda fountain at the back of the place. As you went to the back alley, there was another entrance with a glass door where you'd walk right into the cafe to get a piece of pie and a cup of coffee. A great little drugstore. And I, I haven't seen Siltest ice cream in years and years. Here's another good shot of Wendland's. 
That was the place when, when you were on South Street. It's one of the few places I remember, other than National Bank of Commerce, that told you what time of day it was with an old bulb clock, digital clock. There's Spencer's. Not the greatest shot. That's the only one we have of the exterior. I think I might have a few interiors here. Okay, we've talked about that before. Tom straightened me out on those rope ladders one day. I was trying to figure out how they got those bulbs up there. Anything to add on that, Bob? No. What a, what a fabulous thing that was to see. I, uh, I always like it when I'm coming from the west and I, the capital welcomes me back home. And can you imagine if you'd come out of a blizzard like we had a couple of weeks ago and You'd fought your way back to Lincoln. That'd be a welcome sight to see that beacon of lights up there welcoming you back home again. It was last Tuesday. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right. Again, we've got another 59 uh, centennial photo here. And I always love looking at these because, boy, how times have changed. Can you imagine an owner of a business letting you get up on their membrane roof today? Stomp around up there. Look at all the kids up there. I can show you the very same thing at Walgreens for a Christmas parade. There's just dozens of kids up there. And you don't know if they got up there because they let them up there or they got up there because they knew how to get up there and nobody bothered them. Ouch. Haven't seen that in a while. Of course, 20th and O Street here. The old Ma Kelly's Hotel across the street. At that, at that time, it was called the Midtown Hotel. And, of course, down towards the middle of the block, we had the Greenwich Cafe, and you had the House of Suds, and you had all those little businesses that existed <laughs> right in there. Good price on gas. It is a good price on gas, and we'll never see it again. Had to throw in another. I, I like the blur on this. I think it was from the actual animation and the chattering of the bulbs that caused this when the picture was taken. Okay. I think there's an interior shot. Just throw some questions out if you want to talk about anything we looked at or go back to anything. But why be sure, be sure and ask me a question. we got about five minutes. I'll just kind of let these scroll. Where's that? Chubbyville, that was at about 27th and what, Apple, somewhere in there? Still there. Still really still there. It's a There's 14th and South. There's another great gas price. Shortstop was up at 27th and O. The Sleepy Hollow. Uh, when we were looking at uh, the Starview Drive-In there before, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to talk to um, the gentleman that ran the Buffalo Motel, I'm trying to remember his name, Harvey Gates. He has wonderful stories to tell about the Buffalo. So, any questions? Well, thanks for coming out on such a cold day. Wow.